I would like to thank everybody for joining us. And this is a live webinar to talk about coronavirus having entered Gaza. And we're going to be speaking with people on the ground. And I would like to welcome our guests. We have uh, Anne Wright from both Code Pink and the U.S. to Gaza. And we are joined by Rudd, who is in Gaza, and he is with the group We Are Not Numbers, who is a co-host of this wonderful webinar. And, um, you know, the first two cases of coronavirus have now been reported in Gaza, and I myself am quite terrified and we should have, have some more panelists joining us as well. We're just gonna wait for them. But if we could just start with you, Rod, if you could. Now they're on the yep. ground in Gaza. Wait, can you repeat that because I lost her voice if I could what? Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, I just lost your voice. Uh, you were saying, could you? Sure. Give us just an overview of what things are like right now at this moment, what's happening on the ground. Okay, uh, so basically uh, here in Gaza situation is escalating right now. Uh, things are changing very fast and people are freaking out. Uh, the reason that this is happening right now is because as you know, the world knows, uh, Gaza has been under blockade for 14 years, and uh, once the coronavirus spread around the world, uh, most countries around the world got it, but it didn't get here, and it took so long to get here that actually people started to believe it's not going to get here. So uh, the borders are usually closed, uh, and very few people can cross those borders. So there was like almost no chance of coronavirus coming here to Gaza. But right now, all of a sudden, uh, it was announced here in Gaza that uh, we've got two cases, our first two cases. So uh, I think to people, it just got real. So people started to freak out because if we got two cases here in Gaza, it means it's not safe or it's not as safe as everyone thought it is. So people right now, like they're trying their best to go out by schools, schools are also, they're off right now. They've been off for some weeks. Uh, the government here in Gaza is trying its best to prevent people from connecting, from shaking hands, from uh, transferring uh, the virus, uh, if it exists here in Gaza in any case. Uh, when it comes to the future uh, of Gaza, uh, when it comes to people here, what they think, uh, I think uh, because people actually thought uh, this coronavirus is not very serious, but right now uh, more people are realizing how serious it is. So people are sort of like freaking out. So uh, as I said before, uh, they're trying to be indoors as, uh, as, as usual as possible. So they prevent any uh, chance to go out. So right now people are trying to work from homes. Uh, classes are being recorded uh, on cameras right now. Uh, Gus is using online education for the first time ever, uh, which is pretty new. And people, students, universities, and um, even doctors, they're getting used to that. And uh, people, uh, they're starting to use uh, sanitizers like this one. Uh, I don't think the majority of Gaza has ever used this, but right now everyone uses these because you've got to keep it safe, you've got to keep it uh, responsible, not only for you because you care about your family, about your friends. And uh, uh, that's pretty much the case right now. Uh, people are just more careful than ever. And... Uh, uh, there are some organizations here in Gaza. There's spreading awareness. Uh, there's so many initiatives here in Gaza that teaches people um, how to deal with this coronavirus, uh, how to be clean, and uh, other activists online on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and other platforms. They're trying to warn the Gazan people about this coronavirus and how to deal with it. 
for a better chance of avoiding this coronavirus. Uh, right now, the two cases, uh, they're not in Gaza. Basically, they're at the border. Uh, the government here said that those two, uh, two cases are prevented from going out, from dealing with people, from interacting with people. So basically, they're isolated. Uh, in that border and no one, almost no one gets there. And even the doctors, uh, the, the other passengers who are on the same bus and um, anyone, anyone has ever deal with them. Uh, they're in quarantine right now. Uh, okay. So, um, just, hey, is this you, best man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I was just telling them about uh, the situation here in Gaza and about uh, the two coronavirus we've got. And uh, they're isolated right now in the border, and uh, the government is trying its best to make sure that those will be the only coronaviruses, uh, the the only coronavirus cases here in Gaza. Yeah, Can you hear me? Yes. I no. Hello, Basman. Uh, we are super aware of the Hello. shortage of resources in Gaza, including mm -hmm. medical supplies. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yes, okay. So we are unfortunately very aware of the shortage of medical supplies in Gaza, as well as other supplies because of the siege. How prepared do you think Gaza's healthcare system is to deal with um, even a quarantine of many people? And but then, if things do begin to spread, uh, yeah, I think that because of the because we all know here in Gaza that the medical system is uh, is really weak and outstretched because of the blockade and uh, the wars and. Uh, that's what the government have tried to do is to keep the virus out of Gaza because we know if it's if the virus uh, separate inside it will be a disaster so that's why uh, the government tried to just keep it outside of Gaza but uh, even with the, with his uh, the medical is shortage and uh, the, even the quarantine is not uh, have that good safety standard and good medical standard because of the, you know, Gaza is very crowded and uh, due to also the blockade. So I think we all know it will be a disaster if there is a spread for the virus. I see a, a question coming in um, asking about the health capacity in Gaza, the number of hospital beds that you have available of ventilators. And uh, I've seen that Israel has sent in 200 test kits and that is yes. it. Um, yes. If you could talk about Gaza's capacity and also how that relates to the electricity situation. The electricity situation is really bad. It's the same. It uh, eight hours on and eight hours off. For the medical capacity, we all know that the medical capacity is very limited. Like as you said, Gaza is two million people, and Israel just sent two hundred uh, tests. Uh, test material, so it's uh, very limited for what we have, and we have very, I don't know about the numbers exactly, but there is very limited bed, there is very limited men, uh, mechanical ventilation, and very limited test material, so uh, we hope it wouldn't spread because as I told you, if it's spread, it will be a disaster because we know that our medical system is very weak and outstretched as well. Yeah, it is also important to note that here in Gaza, we've got Rafah city and uh, Rafah has got a population of 250K. So many people out there, but Rafah has got no hospital at all. 
So uh, whenever people are sick or they've got a disease, illnesses of all kinds, they do not have a city. Uh, they do not have a hospital in the city. So basically, they're going to have to move to other cities. And uh, that takes time. And uh, it, it doesn't make it any easier for the patient. So uh, uh, the situation here in Gaza, when you talk about hospitals uh, and, and the health system here, uh, it's important to say that the health system here is very weak. It's been already weak before coronavirus, but you can imagine right now how it is even weaker right now. And uh, uh, because we've got so many wars, uh, I think uh, people here in Gaza already know that, that the system is really weak. But I think the world knows from those wars that the hospitals in Gaza cannot deal with any kind of um, complicated cases. So uh, I think uh, it is important to know that hospitals here are almost useless in this case. Uh, we don't have professional doctors to deal with coronavirus. And even if we do, uh, there are just very few people. And you can tell the population of Gaza is like over 2 million people. And they're living here. I mean, if, if you want to talk about like how big Gaza is, it's like uh, 365 square kilometers. That's a very small place and it's very crowded. And uh, if coronavirus manages to get into the public, into people, it's going to cause a disaster. And... Uh, People here, uh, they're living in very bad uh, conditions and uh, poverty is making it hard on people. So people are going to have to work right now. They've got no chance. They cannot stay indoors. They're going to have to go outside to work to make money because if they don't manage to make money today, they not eat today. And uh, I mentioned that in my piece that I wrote, the article I wrote for Rihanna Thumbers, called Ben shared it as well. Uh, I, I had this uh, personal uh, situation with the driver, a cab driver here in Gaza, and he was freaking out about not the virus, not the coronavirus. He doesn't care as much as about uh, coronavirus as he cares about feeding his kids. So he literally told me, the day that I don't go out and work and make money, I don't eat. And uh, that's really tough here in Gaza. And um, that's going to make it even harder for people to stay indoors. Uh, they're, they're just going to have to go outside to make money. Yeah, and uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, and the the, the so the I put the link to your article in the chat for people who are participating on Zoom, and encourage mm -hmm. folks to read it. What is hand washing like there? Um, I'm aware that ninety seven percent of the water in Gaza is not fit for drinking. Um, how many homes do or do not have running water and how able to adequately hand wash are people? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, the idea is, yeah, there is running people in the uh, houses of Palestina, but uh, the water itself is not so clean. This is a problem. So... We teach people how to wash their hands properly, and we teach people how to just keep the washing process for like 20 seconds or more. But uh, the idea is the water itself is not so clean, and there's no way to, to just to, to fix such a thing with this, with the whole situation here in Gaza. Anne, I want to bring you into the conversation. Anne is with both the U.S. Boat to Gaza, as well as Code Pink and Veterans for Peace and probably some more organizations. But Anne, what is um, your experience with trying to get supplies into Gaza? And uh, what are your thoughts um, and questions for our speakers? Well, first, our heart goes out to the people of Gaza for the extreme conditions that they find themselves. Uh, I, as you mentioned, I'm part of uh, the U.S. Boats to Gaza, and also that is a national campaign uh, with the uh, Gaza Freedom Flotilla. And in 2018, we attempted to get uh, uh, boxes of supplies, 108 boxes of medical supplies into Gaza through the flotilla. Uh, and the Israeli military stopped uh, the flotilla 
and then has refused to send the boxes of medical supplies on into Gaza. Uh, there are other organizations, though, that are able to uh, get some supplies in, and we would certainly encourage everyone listening to uh, make donations to organizations like the UN Works and Relief Agency uh, with Rebuilding Alliance. Uh, there are several organizations that still are able to get supplies into, into Gaza. And at this particular time, it's so important. Our, our Gaza Freedom Flotilla for 2020 has uh, suspended its uh, uh, voyage. We were going to leave in May, but because of the coronavirus, of course, it's just too dangerous to be sending a ship around, even though it's very, we want to continue our educational efforts, which is the whole point of the flotilla, to, uh, to have educational events about what's going on in Gaza in all of the countries that our campaigns are in. And then the, the sending of the flotilla, uh, we hope brings international attention again into Gaza. Uh, one question I have though for our panelists uh, from Gaza, I was reading the Pal uh, Palestinian Center for Human Rights report uh, that talks some about the facilities that are being set up, uh, uh, one in uh, Rafa and other places. And as you mentioned, it's not a, a hospital, but it is a, an isolation or quarantine place for the people that are coming back into Gaza, the few that are able to come uh, from medical treatment in either Egypt or Israel. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anne. I want to go back to this question about how people are feeling. And I know you brought up that for most people, work right now is more important than the economy. Um, do people there trust what they're hearing about the coronavirus? And what is that balance between being able to feed their families if Gaza went into a lockdown uh, like much of Europe is in right now, like parts of the United States are in, would people have enough food? Well, that's a really uh, good and complicated question. Uh, it is important to know uh, that in 2017, actually, uh, one of the individuals here in Gaza uh, were living below the, the poverty level here in Gaza. So you can imagine how harder the situation has got, you know, in the past two or three years right now. So I, I think uh, we don't have a strategy here in Gaza to feed people because uh, if people cannot go out and work, uh, they're not going to get any food. Uh, I think uh, at this point, uh, this is my personal opinion. Uh, people are just going to have to stick together. Uh, what I mean by that is that uh, people here in Gaza are known for their generosity, and uh, especially in cases like war, because we've been through war a lot. So uh, those people who have got food or who have got money, they would just stand side by side with those who don't. And uh, I, I know this is not going to be some you know, form of work to feed other people. It's going to be just familiar, like... Every neighborhood is going to be like one big family. And this one big family is going to feed all these individuals. So, like, we know basically no one's going to die starving here. But we know it's not going to be easy on people. And uh, uh, even people, like, in, in these cases, they're going to use these simplest uh, ways to, to get food and buy food and actually get food. Like, uh, uh, they would donate uh, canned food, you know, to other people. And, uh, you know, you're talking about like small amounts of food, but the point is to survive. And, um, I think, uh, that's, that's the only strategy we've got. It's a, the humane strategy. We don't have a formal strategy like, uh, they do in the U S and other countries. Bosman, do you have any, any thoughts on that as well? Yeah, as I said, uh, it, uh, the problem is that we don't know if the government will be able to offer it anyone, and it will be just like local organization who can just give a canned food or something. And uh, some people, the problem is, as he told, uh, two of the three people here in Gaza is under the poverty level, and some. A lot of people here in Gaza are just a daily worker, like a taxi driver. He just works for his day. 
and uh, that's the problem. He will be just like it's not a monthly or or weekly issue. It's a daily issue, and that will just make the problem harder. I guess. I want to connect this to the West Bank for a minute. I know that there are some cases in Bethlehem, and I've heard in some other cities. I wonder. Um, how much the people of Gaza are following that? And is there a lot of communication back and forth between the West Bank and Gaza right now about the virus? If either of you could answer uh, that. Sorry, I'm wondering about the communication right now for, of everyday people um, between people in Gaza and the West Bank about the virus and how much attention uh, you're paying to the cases of the virus in the West Bank right now and how uh, the West Bank is being um, shut down, which is not uncommon there. But thoughts on that and communication back and forth between uh, Palestinians in Gaza and those in the West Bank? Well, I think the government here in Gaza is in touch with the government there uh, in the West Bank. Uh, we're not talking about politics here. We're talking about the Ministry of Health. And uh, because the West Bank is more open to the world than Gaza is, uh, it was a good thing for us to foresee what's going to happen in Gaza based on what's happening there in the West Bank. Uh, of course, uh, we're one country, Palestine, and uh, we, we watch the news and uh, we hear about Bethlehem and uh, what's happening there and uh, the isolations that people over there are exposed to. Uh, we can tell people over there have got like higher chances of getting uh, the coronavirus because they've got more tourists and more people get in and out. But here in Gaza, uh, that's, uh, th that doesn't happen very often. And uh, I think uh, we've got uh, some instructions from the West Bank, actually. Uh, so like when you talk about like the schools that were off, uh, those instructions came from the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, he's there in the, in the West Bank. And uh, when we talk about like uh, those coronaviruses, uh, like the, the cases, here in Gaza, like I'm not, I'm not quite sure, but I believe uh, people here, doctors, are in touch with doctors over there uh, in the West Bank and um, in other places uh, in Palestine to, to to work together and figure out how to deal with these cases here and there. So in Spain right now, um, I think it's fifth. 42, I might have the number wrong, doctors just arrived from Cuba to help deal with the virus. And if you have the exact number on hand, please let me know. Do you have any hope in Gaza as things get bad that doctors and others might be able to get in? Um, or if you think people won't, I, I did see that Israel has closed the border to Gaza again. Uh, I don't think that's possible uh, at this point. Wait, let me just get this placement, then you get it. Uh, I don't think this is possible because, as I said, the borders are closed. And uh, the fact that anyone that comes to Gaza or from abroad, they have a, a very high chance of having coronavirus through Israel or Egypt. So uh, I, I think it's not going to solve anything. It's going to make things even more complicated. And I think because Gaza, because of the blockade, Gaza doesn't have the necessary materials or equipment, medical equipment in hospitals to deal with coronavirus. So I think uh, the best thing to be done here in Gaza is to get uh, those tests. We've got only 200, as you mentioned, uh, but we've got over 2 million people here in Gaza. So uh, that's totally not fair. That's a very few or very small amount of tests to get here in Gaza. And uh, I, I think uh, people abroad, like, yes, maybe they're handling coronavirus better than us because uh, they're dealing with it more frequently than us. But uh, I think even if they got here to Gaza, um, Right now, the issue is not with the doctors. I think the issue with the 
is with the equipment and uh, the tools we need to, to deal with this situation before it gets uh, extremely serious because once the virus spreads, it's going to be really hard to contain it again. Uh, Asman, you want to take it from here? Uh, yes. Uh, we don't. Uh, we hope so, but we don't have any control over the borders. And uh, as you said, it's not just about doctor. It's about doctor and the equipment and uh, the capacity of the hospitals. You talk about like uh, 500 bed in, in the biggest hospital in Gaza, and it's it's very limited for, for the population, the white population here in Gaza. So we hope so, but uh, we, don't, we, we are not sure about if it's easy to happen or if it's gonna happen in the future. So I wanna correct myself. It was 50 doctors from Cuba and they went to Italy, um, not to Spain. And I think this is this is often a concern for people in Gaza. And usually um, this is due to Israel bombing, but uh, this is a really inhumane situation right now with Israel uh, restricting access to Gaza in this crisis. And before we move forward, and we're going to go to a question and answer section, um, I just want to speak for a little minute and ask you guys to speak about uh, We Are Not Numbers, the organization that uh, you are, both are with. We Are Not Numbers was founded in 2015 by American journalist Pam Bailey and, uh, and others. And it is a writing project to bring the voices out of Gaza. The world often talks about Palestinians only in terms of politics and numbers, how many are killed, injured, homeless, etc. But those numbers can be incredibly impersonal and numbing, and they don't convey the personal struggles and triumphs, the tears and the laughter, the aspirations of Palestinians in Gaza. And so we are not numbers, partners with Palestinians in Gaza and mentors youth to raise up these stories. And if each of you could talk about your work with We Are Not Numbers, um, what you do there, your title and let folks know where they can find some of your articles. Okay, uh, so uh, I, I'm Raed, I'm their outreach coordinator. Uh, I joined with Numbers two years ago uh, and it's been quite the experience of my life so far. Uh, it changed so much uh, because uh, most of us, we've got like 60 writers in the project. Uh, most of us are English language students and uh, we, we love to write, we, we love to express ourselves, and we love to be one of Gaza's multiple voices. And what makes us very special is that uh, we, we use the English language, uh, the international language of the world, to tell stories from Gaza, and that we're just uh, citizen people. Uh, we're citizens, uh, civilians. We, we tell stories from the people's perspective. Right now, I'm not talking to you as an expert, uh, here in Gaza. I'm talking to you as a youth here in Gaza, talking about my, my mindset and what people see and what people hear and what people think and what people want to say. And uh, because Gaza uh, has been uh, under pressure uh, for as long as uh, I have been alive, uh, I think it was very important for this generation, my generation, to speak up. And um, our team in Gaza, our pace in Gaza City, uh, we've got an incredible team. Uh, we work together. Our writers uh, have built a lovely community uh, for us to, to have democracy, to, to create our rights for our own. And uh, so my, my basically my job uh, as the, the outreach coordinator for Rihanna Thumbers, uh, I do uh, social media work. Uh, it means uh, I am one of those people. I've got my social media team. Uh, I answer uh, people's comments and questions and uh, uh, not only from Gaza, from all over the globe. And uh, I also organize some uh, you know, activities, internal activities uh, in the Venet Numbers community. 
And uh, it's very important to note uh, that We're Not Numbers uh, is a project. Uh, it's on its way to become an NGO here in Gaza. Uh, right now, uh, if people from Gaza, somewhere else, Palestinian people want to work stories uh, for We're Not Numbers, you can join right now until the end of the month. And um, Code Bank has been one of our biggest supporters. Uh, they, they supported the, the project in a great way. Uh, soon we're gonna launch our fundraising campaign. Uh, it's gonna be a Ramadan. So uh, because that's how we fund our project, it's an annual thing we do. So uh, if people are interested in our project and they wanna support our project, they can do that as well. Uh, to find more about the project, the articles written there, not only stories, poems as well, we've got Basman, he's a poet. Uh, you can go to weonetnumbers.org. And we've also got our own accounts on social media, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, we are not numbers. Uh, Basman, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Ronald. Habibi. Um, uh, I'm Basman Dirawi. Uh, I have joined uh, We Are Not Numbers since 2015, uh, and uh, We Are Not Numbers just gi gives me a, a platform to speak about myself and my people, and just to show myself behind what is in the news, what is in the media, just to speak yourself by your own tongue. And uh, also, We Are Not number because of We Are Not Numbers and because of our voice is being heard from all over the world. I went last year to Germany and to Switzerland to present We Are Not Numbers there and for the, uh, at the, for the book publishing, the first book for We Are Not Numbers in German. And uh, I guess that, that's all. Uh, I feel like it helps me to develop personally and even with uh, with my language. So, yeah, that's it. Ariel, if I could make a comment. Absolutely. On we are not numbers. Yes, uh, it is really a wonderful platform to, to read about what is going on in Gaza from people that are living there. It's also a wonderful platform for artists, for visual artists. Some of the drawings that some of the We Are Not Numbers people have done, the poetry that's on it, and also uh, the videos and the documentaries. Our Gaza Freedom Flotilla has uh, sponsored two uh, documentaries that are very, very important. One is about the life of Gaza fishers and what the Israeli commandos do to the fishers of Gaza. And the second one was just completed this last year about the uh, amputees, the people who have been shot purposefully uh, by Israeli snipers uh, and who have legs that have been uh, uh, lost, uh, amputated, and the story of still hope uh, despite having those limbs amputated. So we really do applaud all of the, the talent and professionalism that these men and women from Gaza are, are showing uh, and describing what is going on with the Israeli blockade of Gaza. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much, Thank Anne. So we have um, less about 20 minutes left maximum, depending on questions. And we're going to move into the question and answer section, though we have been taking some questions all along. Uh, folks can either type their questions in the chat, or if you see the Q&A button on the bottom, you can type them there. So we have a question from Beth Harris asking about the role that UNRWA is playing in Gaza right now in terms of providing relief and preparedness as um, we worry about this virus getting in it further and spreading. And what are the hopes that UNRWA can be helpful in that way? I think that was not. Uh, I don't know much about the work of the ANORWA, but uh, I think it's helpful. But at the same time, after uh, Trump cut the aid for the ANORWA, it's become such a problem for uh, helping, for giving more help to Palestinians. I mean, the ANORWA give medical help and give some 
food and issues, but I, I'm not sure if they are prepared enough with the, with the, with the financial capacity enough to support uh, the, the, the issue of the pandemic here in, in Gaza, if it's happened. I think uh, the UNRWA is doing a, a good job here in Gaza, but as Passman said, because uh, the aid the UNRWA has been receiving recently is getting decreased through time, uh, the UNRWA is not able to provide more services and more uh, support to our people, the refugees here in Gaza. Uh, so uh, I think when it comes to the coronavirus, uh, the UNRWA could play a major role in spreading awareness, uh, teaching kids how to deal with this and uh, its employees as well, because, you know, teachers are uh, very important in any society, not just our society. And uh, because also the UNRWA is not all, only about education, it's about, uh, it's about uh, you know, getting some clinics here in Gaza, getting some drugs to other people. But right now, because of coronavirus, people uh, basically cannot get their drugs or get uh, any type of uh, medical treatment from the UNRWA's uh, clinics. Uh, right now, the UNRWA is basically not on the map. Uh, I'm not quite sure if the UNRWA is offering food to those who need food the most right now. But uh, I don't think the UNRWA's is doing uh, like a major change right now as it used to. Uh, but I really hope uh, if we ever were to get more uh, tests or tools or equipments or any kind of support from outside Gaza, uh, it would be throughout uh, the UNRWA because uh, UNRWA, the UN has got its power to actually um, get those people and tools to us when we need them. So um, that's my thought on this. There have been a lot of questions about organizations that can get support in and who to donate to. And I wanna say that Code Pink, we will be um, posting some of that and offering avenues for people to give. But Anne, this is something that you've been looking into in the immediate. So if you could speak to this uh, a bit Mm -hmm. Well, I would, I would suggest that people do consider UNRWA as a place to give. Uh, they have always had mechanisms where private citizens could contribute. Uh, and as uh, Raya had mentioned, uh, with, the, with the Trump administration having cut all U.S. financing into UNRWA, they've been under severe financial uh, stress. Uh, but we as private citizens can make donations into UNRWA. So that's one of the places. And then there have been, over the period of many, many years, there have been many organizations uh, from all over the world that have had projects in Gaza. I'll just speak to a couple of them from here in the U.S., but I know there are uh, organizations in uh, Norway and Sweden that have had long-standing ties with uh, medical organizations in Gaza. Uh, but uh, here in the U.S., we've always had the uh, Middle East Children Alliance, uh, uh, that's out of Berkeley. We've had Rebuilding Alliance, which is also out of the Bay Area, out of Berkeley. Uh, those are two very, very strong organizations that uh, have uh, direct ties with organizations in Gaza that are able to uh, help distribute funds to organizations that are, are there. Uh, I will uh, want to also mention that, uh, and I don't know if Jerry Haynes has been able to come on to uh, the program, but uh, she's a medical professional uh, from the state of Washington, and they had a team in, uh, in Gaza uh, three weeks ago. And that organization has also taken in supplies and equipment. So there are uh, avenues, and as, Madeira, uh, pardon me, as Ariel has said, we'll go ahead and post some of the links uh, of places where you can contribute. Uh, we have, in the Gaza Freedom Flotilla, we have uh, you know, had fundraising over the last year for the flotilla, but I, all of our campaigns in an organizational meeting that we had yesterday uh, have all emphasized that right now the, the real critical thing is to have donations be going to organizations that can get medical supplies into Gaza. So we uh, essentially for our US campaign, uh, we're really suspending our, uh, our fundraising for the flotilla and encouraging people to go ahead and donate to other organizations that can 
uh, get medical supplies into Gaza. Thank you. So we're gonna be putting up a list of organizations to donate to on Code Pink's website. And that will be coming by the end of uh, today's workday. But I see a lot of questions as well about what people can do to pressure the national community, to pressure US Congress to speak out. And so I want to encourage people to go to codepink.org COVID-19 Gaza. And uh, you can also, within an hour after this call, just go to codepink.org and we will have things right on our homepage as well. Links for that. And there are also a number of other groups I want to mention that are working hard on this right now here in the United States. Uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, who Code Pink is in conversation with, um, and many organizations are we're in conversation together to talk about a coordinated response in support and solidarity. Um, I know If Not Now is very outspoken right now, and many, many other organizations. And uh, I see a question. Somebody is asking, are the Friday Great March of Return gatherings still happening? And will they be put on hold as a precaution? Uh, actually, the Great Return March has stopped recently here in Gaza uh, because, as the well, first coronavirus is uh, this is extremely dangerous. And uh, because I think uh, it was time for us to save uh, some blood because so many people got injured, so many people got killed. We're talking about big numbers here. Uh, we're talking about thousands of people. We're talking about Jews who, who lost their body parts and those screwed to turn March. So no, they're not happening right now. Uh, I'm not quite sure if there are some decisions for them to happen again in the future. Uh, but uh, right now, I think, uh, well, we, what we really care about is uh, coronavirus and I have to do with that for now. I think that's even you know, more important than going there on defense and protest uh, to free Gaza. Uh, I mean, uh, because of the blockade, basically, Gaza uh, was protected for a short time from coronavirus, uh, but right now that's not happening anymore. So uh, I think for now, everyone needs to stay indoors, not outdoors, because uh, it will be really irresponsible for people to go to the fence right now and protest. Basman, any thoughts on this and thoughts on um, yeah, you know, other avenues that's... for people in Gaza to speak out right now against these this brutal siege and, and occupation? Um, given the, the severe medical situation. For the Great March of Return, I, uh, of return, I don't think it will happen this uh, weekend, this Friday, or until the coronavirus is ended. Uh, you know, we all understand that if there is a lot of injured people, our medical, as we said, our medical system is already outstretched and weak, and we cannot tolerate the injured people with, if it happens, the people with the coronavirus as well. So I don't think, uh, I think the government is already banned all the gathering like wedding parties and so, so it will not be this week and I think it will not be until this pandemic is end as well. Somebody is asking a, a question about whether and how much assistance is coming from the Palestinian Authority right now. Again, I can't hear the yeah. question. Uh, the role of the Pal Palestinian Authority, the PA, right now in working with Hamas and whether they um, are providing any assistance, whether they're able to as well. Uh, I don't think they do enough, personally. I think, uh, I'm not sure if they are in cooperation with each other, with Hamas and BA, but I'm, I think they don't do enough working. Uh, they should work more together 
to prevent the spread of the virus and to get the medical uh, the medical equipment and to support with the medical issues. So uh, I'm not quite sure about uh, if they are work together or work individually, but uh, I see they don't do much enough together. I think I think here in Gaza. Uh... Uh, some spokesman here in Gaza said that they're in touch with the Minister of Health there uh, in the, the West Bank. But when you talk about the PA and what they can do to Gaza, uh, unfortunately, the, the answer is nothing. Because, uh, I mean, at this point, uh, everyone, every area has got its own problems. And uh, I, I think because the coronavirus is very new to this world, people still learn how to deal with it. So uh, I think right now in the West Bank, that they're just barely handling the situation over there. I'm not even quite sure if they're getting under control. But when it comes to Gaza, uh, they may have some uh, medical uh, you know, uh, connection with the West Bank, but when it comes to political or financial or any kind of uh, connection, I don't think that exists right now. I want to let people know that it's now on Code Pink's homepage, codepink.org. You can take action by telling US Congress to speak out, and that will direct you to a petition to the World Health Organization and the UN asking them to act. And let's take just one more question before we close. I see Phyllis is asking, are parliamentarians from the joint list in, on, in Israel's Knesset able to push Israel's health agencies to provide more test kits, hospital equipment, or anything of that sort? And I think we can extend that to, do you hear uh, members of the joint list speaking out at this time and what are they calling for? Well, I think at this point, uh, they're just calling for uh, more security, more protection for the Israeli people themselves. Uh, I'm not quite sure if they're doing anything right now when it, it comes to situation here in Gaza. Uh, yes, they would probably want uh, more medical and more uh, tools to get here because uh, to them, uh, situation in Gaza, I mean, Gaza is still next to them and Gaza affects them just like Gaza affects the whole area here in the Middle East. So, uh, I mean, this is about, you know, uh, a humane side uh, of actions. And if you want to, you can't just be inhumane in this case. This is coronavirus, uh, it's a plague against the second of the whole world. So I think everyone should be, uh, you know, just pushing for what's best for everyone at this point. Anne, I want to I lost see if you, sorry about that. Okay. Anne, I want to see if you have any further questions or things that you want to add before we start to wrap up. Well, we, our hearts are with you in Gaza, and we know what a very difficult time it is under normal circumstances, and to have this coronavirus uh, uh, coming on top of all of the effects of the uh, Israeli, illegal Israeli blockade, both land and sea. Uh, our hearts go out to you, and uh, from uh, your many supporters here in the U.S., we will be doing fundraising to try to get more medical supplies and equipment in to uh, help you uh, counter the effects of this horrible virus. Thank you so much. And before we close, I want to thank all of you for being with us and um, tell you to stay safe and healthy. And I want to remind people how to get connected with We Are Not Numbers. That's wearenotnumbers.org. And um, that link will be, be spreading it out around widely, including links to articles from both of our wonderful panelists, as well as others at We Are Not Numbers, writing about a situation with the coronavirus in Gaza and much, much more. And again, I want to encourage folks to go to codepink.org to see more of what Code Pink is doing and to US Votes to Gaza. 
um, to see the work that they've been doing for years. And as Anne has said, they are now um, shifting all of their fundraising to support the people of Gaza in this terrible pandemic. So I wanna thank everybody for being on. And I think that we will do another one of these um, in the near future to update people again. Thank you. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. Thank you.